Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Brenda Perryman, and welcome to Table Talk with Brenda Perryman right here on TV 33, WHPR, Comcast 20 in Detroit, and all over the world, courtesy of the World Wide Web. And we have quite a show for you today because we're going to be discussing the bankruptcy and pensions. We're going to be discussing legislating the N-word and more. So many things for you to listen to today and chime in on. Also, we have a special guest and we will bring him up in just a few minutes. But first, I'd like you to meet my panel today. Uh, well, my name is Don Lang, a uh, lifelong Detroiter uh, and st still live in the area, obviously. Uh, and I work as an IT project manager for one of the uh, uh, car companies. Good morning or good afternoon. Uh, I'm Chris Sumrall, and I am a public service servant for the citizens of the city of Detroit. Good afternoon. My name is Darnell McLaurin, a Detroit firefighter, and a Western Union, or Western District Union Director for Detroit Firefighters Association, Local 344. And welcome, Don and Darnell. Don and Darnell, that could be a singing group. <laughs> uh, Don and Darnell, I'm so happy to have you on, um, our guest co-host today. And as our tradition with On This Day in African American Life in Detroit by Ken Coleman, who is also a co-host, I'd like to talk about what happened on this day in 1922 on March 7th, because a lot of you could probably relate to it. The Greystone Ballroom opens on Woodward Avenue in Canfield. It will become a popular dance hall and feature big bands led by Glenn Miller, Cab Calloway, Duke Ellington. Regarded as one of the nation's most entertaining venues, the Greystone will earn bill the billing excuse me, as Detroit's million dollar ballroom and accommodate 3,000 people. As a little girl, I heard about the Greystone. Of course, I, I never got a chance to go because it just seemed so grown up. Anyway, although race-based Jim Crow practices are not prevalent in the North at that time, the ballroom will be segregated, a segregated venue for many years. African Americans, however, will be allowed to party there on Mondays. Mondays was called Colored Night. Organizations like the NAACP and the West Side based Men's Social Club called the Nakarima Society, Americans spelled backwards, will host spectacular dances there through the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. And I believe in the 60s, they had like, um, how should I say, they had, they did have some of the singing groups come there and everything. So the Greystone Ballroom, that was a, quite a place, quite a place. And now what we're going to do, everyone, we're going to go to a quick break. We're going to bring our special guest on, and we are expecting a call from California. So we'll be back in just a moment. With the, and you want to stay for our discussion when we get back, so hold on. We'll be right back. And we are back with Table Talk, and we're going to start with some of our hot-button issues. I'd like to once again thank my co-host, Don Lang, and we have Mr. Chris Summerall and Mr. Darnell McLaurin. And one of our things we're going to talk about quickly is My Brother's Keeper, which is the initiative that President Obama started to help black youth. What do you guys think about that? And how, how do you think it's going to work? Well, uh, I, I applaud the initiative um, and the president getting behind it. It's, it's definitely a need to shine a light on the plight of young black men in, in our communities. Uh, and I'm glad that he's directing resources to address that. Uh, the one concern that I do have is that, uh, well, several. One, that he's getting started kind of late in his presidency to address some of these issues. I understand the politics behind it. I understand that he can't be the president of black America. Uh, but we could have used this probably several years ago. Having said that, uh, at least we do have this initiative started. Uh, it, it has the potential to be successful, and I hope it, that it can be successful after his presidency. Yeah, I think that that's what's going to be really the telltale sign of success with this is um, will, it, will it have a legacy? Will it extend further um, than his uh, than his last his his term currently, and so um, you know I think that it was it was very touching that he opened up and talked about some of his personal issues, um, growing up father in a fatherless home, 
and uh, some of the challenges that he uh, uh, experienced and that we can identify with. Uh, some of us, I grew up, my dad wasn't in, in my home, and so I, I identify with his words. Um, but I think uh, along with you, Don, the, the, the point, or we'll have to kind of, you know, reserve judgment to see actually the effectiveness of this. Um, you know, it sounds great. But hopefully it filters down into those who really need it in the community and not and it doesn't get um, you know, sidelined in, in DC. Darnell? Yes. Yeah. That's some of my concerns also is I'm interested in how far reaching it will be. Um, it's a, a vast amount of young black men in America that's affected uh, in a in a negative way. And the amount of money that's attached to this uh, particular bill. I just really interested in knowing how far reaching it will be. How far down will it actually get reach to those who really need it the most? You know, and my concern is they have people on these committees kind of deciding what's going to happen, what's what, and all of that. But, you know, I, I hope it doesn't get too top heavy. And I, it has to come down. What do you think we could do in Detroit area to get that going? Now, there are some good mentorship programs, but. What do you think we could do with the young men who are kind of wayward? Because the president did say, I made a lot of mistakes. And somebody, and when he told of the mistakes, he said, I got high. He did other things. One of the boys said, who, you, that was that you? And you said, like, you made those mistakes and you still became president? You know. I, I, I think one of the first things um, that's necessary is to try to find a common ground for some of these, with some of these young men. So that we're in a, we're approaching them, um, you know, with a level eye. The, they don't feel defensive. Um, we want to reach them. We don't want to speak at them. We want to speak, have a dialogue with them. Um, and I think that each one of us will have a capacity or ability to do something. And if we can identify whether it's some of us have more time, some of us have resources, some of us have great ideas. And so to identify what we can contribute to the to the you know to the recipe, um, I think that that's going to be you know interesting specifically in Detroit because we see a lot of interest in the city not specifically directed toward young African men, um, African American men, and so uh, we're going to have to uh, make a concentrated effort or a conscious effort to uh, make this a top priority because while dollars are coming in the city and attention is coming to the city, it's not really geared toward the African American um, boys in the community. Right, and they are such a big part of our community. And if they could have just other outlets, the, the unfortunate thing is a lot of the schools in the city don't have a lot of extracurricular activities and programs and so forth. I know all of you were involved in high school. Isn't that correct? Yes, yeah, absolutely. There is right. a movie out uh, that just came out recently uh, starring Cuba Gooden Jr. And it was about a, a young man in the D.C. area who came home from prison and, and started a chess club. Uh, and, he, and because he's lied on his application uh, that he was a convict, he uh, was fired from his job where the initial program started, and he opened up a chess house, and it involved a lot of kids in the community. He took them to different test, uh, chess tournaments, and he turned a lot of kids' lives around. I think we a lot of programs are out there, and, and they're good, but I think the adults have to step in. We have to interfere in these child's lives and, and, and show them the way. There's a lot of children that just doesn't, without going to school, they don't see an adult. And so we have to step up as adult and take care of our children, and, and, and then the programs can supplement that. But it all begins with the adults. It all begins with the adults. It, hopefully it begins in the home. Um, if not, I think the teachers, having been a teacher, I just think the teachers play, play a big part in raising children too. Like they say, it takes a village. And I, I think that we had a part, I know that I was particularly close to boys besides girls when I was teaching and it was very important and I did a lot of extracurricular because I felt it kept kids off, you know, stopped them from being idle, you know, so I hope that this initiative works and I share your, what you said, Don and, and Chris and Darnell, I want to see how it plays out, I really do, and I want it not to be an epic fail. Now, pensions, this pension situation here in Detroit area can you explain something now you're both part of the firefighters union da, um, Darnell and um, Chris yes yes now the firefighters 
and city employees and policemen, they're involved in this bankruptcy thing. Could you explain it to us, please, Darnell? Yes. Uh, essentially, uh, Bill, uh, Public Act 436 gave the state the ability to appoint an emergency manager over the finances of the city of Detroit. <clears throat> um, from that, they, they owe, they claim $18 billion. And that $18 billion is everything that the city owe uh, together. So it'll be like your house note. It's not the house note, it's the total amount of the house. Oh. It's the total amount of the car. So they compounded the, the debt to, to get to this level. To pay the creditors off, they want to do that on the backs of the workers of the city of Detroit. It's 9,700 workers in the city of Detroit. Uh, some 4,000 are police and firefighters. Uh, our pension is being attacked. Um, first, you have to understand that the reason why the pension was uh, given constitutional value was because we don't pay into Social Security. So if you take our pensions away, we don't have anything for retirement. Oh, you don't pay into Social we Security? We do not pay into Social Security, oh, and that's wow. one of the biggest reasons why they gave it the constitutionality of uh, uh, status. So if they take our pension, we have nothing to retire on. And this is something that they're not telling the public, uh, and the public needs to know. First of all, Public Act 436, uh, the, 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 state, the citizens of the state of Michigan voted against it. They came, they turned it around, added uh, money to it, so you couldn't take it up for a referendum vote. <clears throat> and, and, and so we can't change that. It's legalized gangsterism, in my opinion. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so, so essentially, um, through that process, uh, the governor appointed an emergency manager to do something that he could not legally do. And um, it, wow, gosh, it, yeah, and so it was pushing his agenda through because from a from a state level, um, he has an obligation to uh, guarantee or to secure those um, those pensions, but the emergency manager doesn't have that um, same responsibility. So that so they are claiming, and so um, we can see that there's a there's a a lot of twists and turns and and what appears to be um, underhanded agenda. And, uh, but even bigger than that, we're talking about not only future retirees, we're talking about individuals who are living on a very modest fixed income currently. And those individuals did not have social security, They right? No, they do not have access to Some social of those, security. Uh, the firefighters exactly. and the- And police. Yes. Right. Oh, now what's being done on behalf of the unions about this or people I know people are protesting but can you tell us a little more right we're challenging we're challenging uh, on every level that we could uh, the uh, state attorney attorney general uh, just came out with a, with, a, with a ruling that it was unconstitutional for Absolutely. the courts to uh, take our pensions to uh, pay off creditors um, the, the judge ruled that he wouldn't be interested in any plan that that um, was had large slash cuts to our pensions. Well, we aren't interested in any plan that had cuts to our pension. We earned those cuts, and after 30, 35 years. You mean you earned the pension? The, the, right, yeah. we are, I'm sorry, we earned those pensions, and after 30 or 35 years, we deserve those pensions. Uh, and if you see the press uh, lately, they were talking about the 10% uh, pension cut. That's a 10% cut, but there's also an 18% cost of living cut that they haven't spoken about. And then there's a hard 8% uh, freeze or cut when the pension is frozen. So, so essentially uh, compounded, you're looking somewhere around 30% cut on average, maybe a little bit more right. um, for those existing retirees as well as those future retirees. And so if you can imagine, let's put it into real numbers, if we're talking about um, a regular uh, pension for a city of Detroit worker, um, we're looking at somewhere around $1,800. A, a, month. a little more, yes. A little bit roughly. more. Let's say two thousand dollars a month. And if we're talking about thirty, uh, not a month. Uh, two thousand dollars a month, a pension. Oh. And if we're talking about a thirty percent cut of that, we're talking about cutting six hundred dollars, oh, or a little bit over six hundred dollars. And so, if you can imagine, we're talking about real numbers here. You know, we we speak in percentages, but we're we're talking about real numbers, and and, and we know that there's nothing getting cheaper. You know, and the conversation exists as far as um, creditors and municipal bond um, investors and things like that. Well, uh, and they're saying, well, these uh, these uh, folks with the pension should should uh, bear a brunt of this load. 
Well, you know, we our position is we beg to differ because although municipal bonds, they're a little, oh, they're less risk as, as far as on, you know, the stock market or something right. like, it's still an investment. And so in any investment, there's a calculated risk. gain or risk. Mm -hmm. But um, as an employee of the city of Detroit, I, I doubt anyone took the job knowing that a portion of their check would be put aside and it may or may not be there um, come their retirement. And so we can see that uh, it's not about logic, it's not about morals, um, um, and it, it, it will really be about opinion and it'll be decided in a court hopefully within the next 12 months or so. That just seems so wrong to lay people's lives out there like that. Yeah, I, uh, I wanted to cede most of my time to Darnell and Chris because uh, you guys are on the front lines. Uh, you had information that wasn't privy to the, the public and you guys needed to bring this to the public so we all could understand. Um, I, I know why the city went into bankruptcy. For the most part, we all do. I didn't think that they were able to manage their way out of their financial crisis. Uh, so I understand them going into bankruptcy. The one thing that I did not want to see happen is what is happening with the pensioners. Uh, what I would like to see is you guys separated from everyone else, made whole, and then let, let uh, uh, the financial institutions have to bear the brunt of uh, what's going to have to happen in straightening out the city's finances. So uh, it, it's just a terrible thing what's happening to the pensioners. Um, Hopefully, uh, this will wind its way through the courts and, and come out on the right side for yeah. you guys. Well, and you know, and definitely, um, we appreciate that. And that's the feedback we've been getting for from mostly everybody. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, our position is that we feel that this was one of the primary reasons to enter into this bankruptcy to um, directly go after these funds that are um, on a nationwide scale uh, doing. Um, in the top five percent, I know our per, our pension was somewhere over ninety five percent, ninety six percent, ninety six percent funded, and so um, we would be in the top one or two percent of um, in the country. In the country, um, yet and still, there's billions of dollars in these funds that they want to gain access to, and uh, they tried in other different ways. And so now, with this emergency manager law and this bankruptcy, um, it's really opening up the door. Um, to kind of uh, pillage those uh, those storehouses, so to speak. Setting and a precedence. Yeah. Yes, and every time, like I looked at the fire that was two days ago on Outer Drive and Schoolcraft and the firefighters out there, I don't know how many companies they had out there to fight that. And then yesterday they showed one that I know was Engine 40. Mm -hmm. It had to be. It was not. It was near Finkel. Right. It was and a Finkel and Green Lawn, I believe. Yeah. Yes, I saw yeah. that. And every time I see that, and every time I see the firefighters, I said they're working so hard, and they're trying to cut. I mean, these people put their li lives on the line. Yeah, and I want to and I want to say this too. If you remember back, the uh, the city of Detroit was owed profit sharing from the state to the tune of roughly two hundred and fifty million dollars. And if you look recently, the state had one point three billion dollar surplus. They could have easily fixed the issues that was in this in the city easily. of Detroit, but they didn't want to do that because it's not about fixing Detroit. It was it was about taking over Detroit, and now okay. they had this deal where they want to uh, bring in uh, or, or save the so-called save the art and this three-part deal with the state and, and the DIA. Private money. Right. Yeah. Even with that deal, there were some connotations attached to that that we would have to take cuts in our pension. So, so it's not about fixing Detroit, it's about taking over Detroit. Well, Control. quickly, uh, what can we, the citizens, do? The citizens need to be aware of what's going on, pay attention, and you have to seek out information because the citizens of Detroit are, 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 are voters and, and they elect these individuals into office and you have to understand when you elect someone, do they really represent you? Do they represent your best interest? And that's what people really have to understand. The, 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 the citizens of the state of Michigan voted uh, at down that the governor did. They re they redid that uh, uh, act, which was Public Act 436. And essentially everything that they wanted to do, 436 gave them the ability to do that because they attached funding to it and where it could not be put up for a referendum vote now. So you have to be conscious of who you're voting for, why are you voting for them, and do they serve your interests. Wow, excellent, excellent. You hear that, ladies and gentlemen? We have to, because if it happens here, it'll happen anywhere. It, Don't you agree? Absolutely, and um, it's really just an indicator of what's coming to a theater near you. 
Um, you know, there were times when, um, as uh, public servants, you know, we were confident that, uh, you know, that the service that we provided and what we put on the line every day, our lives and our, our well-being, um, that we would be taken care of. Um, but that's not the case. And so what we want to do, we want to act as ambassadors for the people that are a little bit out of arms reaching out to let them know, like, look, do not think that, don't think that this doesn't affect you. Because it's coming soon. It's coming faster than you think. And it's definitely going to affect you one way or the other. Um, we've got an issue now where individuals, it used to be, when I, when I uh, joined the Detroit Fire Department, there were uh, around 10,000 folks who would, who would line up to, uh, to uh, try and become a, a servant for the citizens of the city of Detroit. Yeah. It, it's getting to the point now to where individuals are questioning, is it worth it? Because not only are we, are we talking about pensions, but we're talking about um, also health care if you're injured on the job. There's a, there's a classic example. You want to tell them about, uh, Dougie, how this individual um, is paralyzed. He's paralyzed, and now um, his medical benefits the benefits that he needs for therapy, for uh, diff different medical equipment, they've been taken away. Right. Essentially, they eliminated health care for retirees. They have to go on the open market and, and search out a health care a healthcare plan. The city has given them $150 a month stipend. And I don't know if you've been out in the, on the market looking for health care. $150 will not pay for health care, let alone for a family, but even for uh, or, uh, a couple. Absolutely. So essentially, any individual who's on a duty disability through the uh, city of Detroit uh, is given a $400 a month stipend. The difference is uh, a good firefighter, Doogie, Brendan uh, Maluski, was injured at a fire on the east side of Detroit and was paralyzed from the waist down. Well, he's simply another member that was put on the duty disability. There isn't a category for, you know, bad injuries, good injuries. Yeah. Everybody that's on the duty disability Same has lost though. their health care. And so this individual who needs therapy, equipment, everything for his uh, Nursing, uh, paralyzation, PT, exactly, has ongoing. been essentially eliminated. But they gave him a check for 400 bucks this month. Well, I echo what Don says. The public needs to know more about this. Don't you agree? Yeah, and this is, they're setting this up to replay itself in other municipalities around the, the state right. of Michigan. Uh, and it hasn't gone unnoticed that these municipalities, for the most part, uh, are predominantly black cities. So there's a racial component to this as well um, that I don't know if you guys want to get into. So we have to keep an eye into as what's going on. Uh, I would like to know how we could become more involved uh, outside of knowing what's going on, who do we need to reach out and, and, and touch? Uh, my understanding is there are some representatives in the, the state uh, house that are is, they're working to try and block this, but they're outnumbered. Those are Democrats who are outnumbered. So exactly. what are some of the other things that we can do to address this? Uh, you can contact your, your locals. You can contact your AFL-CIO. You can contact any of the, uh, the, uh, the unionized locals. Uh, there's a lot of things that's going on. I, I have a, 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 another source of information that I could uh, also give to you. Um, but the citizens need to be aware, understand, watch the news, really pay attention to what's going on because it's, it's affecting us now, but it will eventually affect everybody else er, uh, In later. In the future. Exactly. And I understand the citizens need their services. They do. They need the garbage collection. They need police and fire protection. They need uh, EMS when you call them. Uh, they need lights on. So they need a lot of things. The city has to figure out a way to provide the service to the uh, community, uh, but they have to do it reasonably. Right, absolutely. And speaking of race, uh, one of the other social topics we wanted to talk about was the N-word. Recently, ESPN, they did an outside the line special on the N-word, but they want to, there's a man named John Wooten, who he's with some organization, I'm not sure which one it was, I'll find it, but he's with the, uh, this organization and they want to ban it from football and if you use it during a football game there's a 15 yard penalty for use of that word on the field now guys i want to do you think you could legislate something like that no <laughs> yeah, not on the field uh and who are they supposed to be legislating i mean yeah. uh it for the most part on the field whether you like the word or not those, uh, uh, that word is being used by black athletes towards other black athletes. Rare, uh, though it happens, rare does it happen 
uh, with a white athlete talking towards a black athlete. Well, incognito use. Well, th that's the rarity, uh, but it does happen. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but you can't legislate as much as I hate that word, you can't legislate uh, morality. You can't legislate the N-word right. out of uh, private entities such as the NFL uh, or in our society as a whole. And, and I, I think it's a, it's a classic example of seeing the straw in one person's eye while you have the rafter in yours. Um, the, the NFL also has a team um, and it is known as the Washington Redskins. And we know that there's been a lot of uh, conversation of how that's quite offensive. Well, the owner recently came out and said, I'm not changing the name. And there, it seemed as if that just went away. Um, and I think that this is, a, unfortunately, this is, uh, it, it appears to be another example of policing black folks. Um, because again, this isn't directed toward anyone um, except the black players. Exactly, why the N word? Why not foul language altogether? Period, exactly. Uh, why that particular word? Why shine light? on that word that has caused a lot of havoc in our community since and, the beginning of our time. And, and it, what it's gonna do, it's gonna highlight and it's gonna bring attention, unnecess unnecessary um, um, bad attention to players who are just playing in the game and, and, and while I don't condone um, the use of the word, it's, it's really gonna play uh, what I think would be an unfair or inappropriate factor in, in the game. You know, I, I can only imagine how that would play out and uh, you know how it would really, as a, as a fan of the game, and as uh, you know, not a fan of the word, I can imagine um, some of the scenarios in which that could possibly happen, and so forth and so on. And I think that it's the NFL is really trying to bite off more than it can chew. Sure, yeah. And uh, while there may be some really great points, and it may have be a great soundbite, I think again, like Don said, you can't legislate morality. And, uh, and I think that it's much ado about nothing, and we'll see. I, I think the Players Association will have a lot to say about it, too. I think John Wooten is trying to address a social issue on the field of the NFL, and I, I just don't believe you can do that. But, but also, if, if you look at the commissioner in the NFL, he is, um, you know, he's known as kind of like a, a little tyrant, and I don't know if him and Wooten got together, uh, um, but you know, he uh, tries to rule with, a, with an iron fist. And, you know, maybe this is, this is another way of him trying to exert authority or, or something, I don't know. But um, again, I don't think that this is appropriate an, an appropriate, um, you know, subject for the NFL to try to test. I think that if it, even if it came from the players union, I could respect it a little bit more, you know. Um, but, you know, coming from uh, Mr. Wooten, I, I think that it's really on shaky ground. Right. Uh, they were talking about the coach of the Pittsburgh Steelers walked through the locker room and he was and, and some of the players were listening to the radio or, or music or whatever and, and the music was playing had the n-word in it and he told him he didn't want to hear that type of music in his locker room and so they turned the music off uh, I heard I have a, a white friend who heard someone use the word and got upset I, I really can't f fathom how Folks who use this word freely for many years, decades, are now telling people who do use it in, in their own circle, you can't use that word. But you know, sometimes people come to an awakening, you know, and say, wow, I shouldn't have used that word. I remember and you all were little people when Richard Pryor said that he wasn't going to use that word anymore. I wasn't that little when he said yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Didn't we bury that word? Please, they buried that word. It re <laughs> resurrected <laughs> itself. Right, yeah, yeah. I mean, they, the NAACP buried the N-word a few years ago, right. and it resurrected itself. Yeah. It's just, it's going to have to start with the people who want to or don't want to uh, use it, because at some schools, they were talking to these kids who went to an interracial high school, and it was just a part of what uh, the way they talked, and it was uh, allowed in other words. And I, right. I it, think you have to. I think you have to have respect for yourself, and, and 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 curb what you do and what you say for yourself. Uh, certainly on the playground, on the basketball court, which end up being the NBA court and end up being the NFL. That word has been thrown around and used. I don't think anybody 
and I don't know, but I, I, I certainly wouldn't call or, or I haven't seen anyone call a white person that word. It's always spoken in between uh, uh, friends, pals, buddies. You can say they use that as a term of endearment. However it is used, I'm saying to, to stop it is going to be virtually impossible. You can throw a flag on it if you want to, but to stop the word from being used is almost virtually impossible. It has to be the individual who wants to correct himself. It's just like you do certain things in front of your parents. It's certain things you don't do in front of your parents. So if using that word, it's some places that they don't use it. And it's strange that when you're talking to them on a, on, as a, as when a reporter got a mic in their face, they don't use it. So they know when, it, when, when to use it and when not to use it. Um, but to stop it on the field, I think it's going to be impossible. As Chris said, this is going to be a battle that's going to be, uh, I believe, un unwinnable. What I'd like to see um, is that the, the NFL actually has done a really good job with several programs that they have um, when individuals enter into the league, where they basically take these college kids and they put them through about two to three weeks of intense class and it's and it's really a sensitivity training it's about business how to manage your funds so forth and so on and so I'd like to see an education um, as far as maybe the history of the word how it affects people how people receive it maybe you know I'd like to see maybe that incorporated versus just okay we're gonna penalize you 15 yards every time we hear it and so to give to, to give some understanding to why it is offensive maybe in that training maybe um, in in each uh, team's mandated uh, training camp. Maybe they have some type of sensitivity training every year. And, and from there, I think that it will be from the inside out yeah. versus just force fed, which people are well, naturally going to reject. Also, uh, we've, been, we've seen the sports talk shows uh, in recent weeks about the use of the N-word. Uh, and there are several issues here. One, uh, the use of the word amongst African American people themselves, how we use it amongst ourselves. Two, how other people use that word uh, towards uh, black Americans, and lastly now uh, trying to legislate that word in a place of business, which is what the football field is. And I don't think throwing a flag uh, for a 15-yard penalty is going to address any of that. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see how that's going to play out. Uh, and also season. another point, they tried to bring up the history of the word. And uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, he was having dinner with John Wooten one evening, and there's this lady, this white woman who came up to the table and said, you sure are tall, and it just asked him to stand up and everything. He stood up and, you know, because Kareem is about seven foot, right? right? A little over there, about seven three. Seven, three yes, yeah. and then she said to John Wooten, wow, that's a tall N-word you're, you're sitting here with you. Mm -hmm. You got a tall N-word sitting here with you. Mm -hmm. And he just felt, he could just shrink. I mean, what do you do? What do you do? And then they talked, Common talked about the fact how it's used as a so-called term of endearment yeah, and everything. I think a lot of people just don't understand the history of the, the word. It's become, it's actually part of a fad that's gone on for years and years and mm -hmm. years. And I'll never forget, I had a young man in class. I didn't allow it in my class. And I had a young man who said, uh, he said that. And I had warned him, you can't say that. And I went and called his dad, because I was suspending him. And his dad said, oh, Miss Pyramid, <laughs> you know they all say it. They all say that. They, I said, listen, I'm trying to teach him the language of the marketplace. He already knows the language of the street. Because if he gets out there and using that word, you know, he's not going to get that job. He's going to maybe be fired from that job. I think we just need to teach a little more about the history. Absolutely. Plus, I had a, a paper on the history of the word and everything, and I had the students who I suspended really write an essay on it. And, and, and again, lastly, I can't think, and I challenge the rest of the panel to think of a more polarizing or more um, a word that has so much controversy. You know, it's interesting that in this country, blacks are still a minority, but that word that is associated with us, that's still, you know, the word that any, and when you go, um, you know, outside the United States, it's still a word that's shrouded in so much um, negativity. Um, you know, it could be a little bit of unknowing. They don't know how to take it. Is it a term of endearment? Is it something offensive? You know, because there's a what flip side. There's a flip side to where individuals who have have uh, received some of the backlash and, and some of the treatment from racist comments, and they may feel slighted that 
you think a 15 yard penalty is is equivalent to you know checking this word and so there's always two sides to that coin and, and I think that the NFL needs to understand that they're a business and that their product that they do well is play football it's not to legislate um, conversation so um, stick to what you do best and well, if you've ever been to a, some of the rap concerts and some of these expensive ones where most of the audience is white and the rappers are using the n-word they're up there they know every word and they're singing it along with the rappers and when I saw that I didn't know how to take it. You know, you see all these white people say, yeah, inward, this and that. I mean, it was like, are we supposed to, oh, on, on this ground, this hollowed ground, we have to give a pass for that because it's part of a song. That was, that's another dilemma. Yeah, so it's, uh, we'll see, we'll see how that, how that goes again. I, you know, I well, think good that, luck to yeah. that. Good luck with that. Yeah. And we didn't get a chance because I know we're going to sign off in a minute, a couple of minutes. But we wanted, to, we wanted to talk, ladies and gentlemen, about Lupita Nyong'o's win and what that could mean for black women and girls and stuff. And a lot of people have been talking about how she set another standard for beauty. Well, that's a standard of beauty that we have had as a people for eons. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I think that what it, what it did, you know, it brought the, the eye to something that we've known for a long time. Um, she's beautiful as in her outward appearance, obviously, but she, the word that I think about when I watch her, um, or when I listen to her is regal. And it, it brings an association of what we've always known, that, that, that our, our beautiful black women are queens, they're, they're, they're regal. But the way that she Thank cares- Thank you. You're welcome, you're quite welcome, my queen. <laughs> but uh, but so now what we see is a dynamic as to will this become popular culture? Will it become um, popular to, to just be natural? To be natural, but also to take pride in, in, in richer skin, you know, well, in, in, in all in, skin. It, it well, well, it's yeah. always I, I, and, I, and I, the reason why I said richer skin or darker skin is because that there has been historically pride in being unfortunately lighter skin versus dark skin. And right. so, and, yeah. and unfortunately. And Henry Tyler has just given me the wrap up sign and this has been the fastest hour in television. They cut off on the one dark skin guy on the panel. You see what I'm talking oh about? Oh gosh, <laughs> you are just so, oh man, second class, man. No, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. Um, Don, thank you. Darnell, My thank pleasure. you so much. You thank all you add so, so much. much. And we yeah. could've, we could've done an hour on the pension. They got to come back next week. Well, they got to come back yeah. next week. So. Well, I hope you'll be back. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we will see you next week on Table Talk with Brenda Perryman. And we will see you, of course, at 9 o'clock next week because we have a congressional candidate uh, on my morning show and we have Dr. Griffin. So we got a lot happening here at TV 33. So I want to thank Devin Cobb and I want to thank his mom, April, and Cheryl Ajimu also. Thank you. <laughs>